Well, I think we can start. We usually have some little delay. Uh, people need some time to find this sacred place here where the knowledge about new climate change is going around the world. New climate change research is going around the world. And so I want to welcome the audience here. I want to welcome particular our speakers and I want to welcome the people who are watching this on live stream. This, uh, I was asked to mention the hashtag at CCECON uh, for Twitter. So um, I'm Willy Zemmler, I'm an economics department member and uh, research associate of the SIPA. SIPA is the Schwarz Center for Economic Policy Analysis, which is a kind of uh, progressive think tank to deal with uh, big topics of our time. One of the topics is uh, climate change. Uh, there's a website there and you can log in there. Um, this event was also uh, organized by the SIPA and in particular by a very efficient SIPA team, Bridget uh, and uh, Diana and Julia, and they uh, were uh, very active the last few days to get this uh, event going. Um, this event is also funded by uh, some external sources, by the Thyssen Foundation of Germany, and we also got some uh, funding now from the uh, Dean's Office of the New School. So the next two years of, of these talks are secured through the Thyssen funding, so we will have in the next few two years uh, every semester so this uh, event. And uh, we have a very special topic here uh, today. Um, I uh, just want to remark that uh, the, we had many topics discussed here and many topics uh, where research policy oriented uh, topics, US oriented uh, policies, uh, global policy topics, uh, Paris conference, uh, European Commission uh, policies and those things were discussed here. Um, what we want to do today is studying the impact of weather shocks and extreme weather events on uh, countries, regions, uh, and how they are going to cope with this, those shocks. Uh, the climate researchers, the climate or the earth scientists, which is well, a very special group on studying the physics of the Earth and the climate. They warn us that there are uh, slowly rising, uh, slowly rising temperature, but there are a lot of extreme events that might come. So, uh, hurricanes, uh, tycoons, uh, flooding, uh, heat waves, uh, forest fires. Um, ocean level rises, uh, and those events are usually very local. Uh, and so the weather extreme events uh, are local and produce big disasters. But uh, up to now that hasn't been much, so to speak, studied. And you no, know, I was very lucky that I found uh, last, uh, for last term in the world report of the IMF, a uh, very big chapter that studied the impact of these weather extremes on uh, uh, well, the economy, on people, on health, on the environment, and all those, uh, those aspects. And uh, I'm very happy that we have today Petya uh, Topalova. She is a lead author, the lead uh, author of this uh, chapter there of the IMF research. And the IMF is very much concerned also with the impact, particularly on developing economies. And I just want to mention a few things about uh, Petya. She is a deputy division chief of the IMF research department. She studied uh, and got her PhD from MIT. Uh, she worked uh, particularly on Euro, Europe as area as, uh, of uh, research competence, Asia and the Pacific. Uh, uh, area. Uh, she's a lecturer at Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Government and uh, her research pioneered climate change policies with regard to economic development and uh, international trade. And so we are very happy to have, have such an expert here who can tell us about the uh, impact and the 
results of this weather extreme around the globe. So, welcome. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a great honor to be speaking in front of you about uh, some very new work that we did at the IMF on uh, the economic impacts of uh, weather shocks and with the, with the hope of knowing more about what may come as the climate continues to change. Uh, as you may be aware, the IMF is not a place that traditionally has put much emphasis on the effects of weather, but uh, in the past few years, we have come to the realization that this is something that is really of macroeconomic, uh, co has many macroeconomic consequences, and it's macrocritical. Uh, and this chapter was kind of our way of signaling uh, our thoughts about how important these issues are becoming for the welfare of countries as a whole, and in particular, low-income countries. Uh, so this is work that was done by a large team, Sebastian, Michu, Natalia, and Marcus, Evgeny, and myself, um, and also with the help of many, many hours of research assistance time and computing time. Um, I don't need much of a motivation for this audience, but I just wanted to put out this chart, which I think is extremely, extremely telling. What we have plotted here is the average global temperature over a very long period of time, going back to you know, 20,000 years ago. And what we can see in this chart is that there have been substantial fluctuation in average temperature, in the Earth's average temperatures. Uh, but these fluctuations have occurred over very long periods. And during times like when the Earth was coming in and out of the Ice Age, and during times when human life was very different than what it is today. But what stands out in this picture is this very large blurb, this large you know, pickup in temperature in, the, in what we see in the blue, which has re really happened in the last 30, 40 years. We see an increase in temperature, which is very striking in terms of the speed at which it is happening. Going forward, there is very large uncertainty of what exactly it will happen. It will really depend on the extent to which we are able to curb greenhouse gas emissions. But scientists project that if we do nothing, uh, if we just continue living as we are living now, temperatures could rise by as much as 4 degrees centigrade by the end of the century. And you can just see in this chart what a dramatic thing this will be for, for our planet. So, as macroeconomists at the IMF, we wanted to try to understand three questions. The first question is, should we be worried about this rapid increase in temperature? Does this have macroeconomic consequences? Will it affect economic activity and growth, which is you know, what we care about at the IMF primarily, and financial stability? We wanted to know whether certain countries are more vulnerable to this uh, rise in temperatures that we are observing than others. And we wanted to understand what are the channels through which the rise in temperature affects growth. The second question that we wanted to understand is, is there a way for countries to cope to deal with weather shocks? Because increases in temperatures are going to happen, even if we curtail, completely eliminate all greenhouse gas emissions. There are such high concentrations in the planet, the temperatures will continue to rise for the next few decades. So can countries do something to deal with uh, the macroeconomic shocks that these rises in temperatures will have? And you know, going forward, um, if we take what scientists project uh, as granted, what would be the likely impact on, in particular, on low-income countries? To give you a very quick preview of our findings, we find that temperature increases have very uneven effects across the globe. In areas that have currently hot climates, and this is predominantly you know, where most low-income countries are, current, are, are located, an increase in temperature has very, very adverse economic consequences. It lowers per capita GDP. Um, and this effect is uh, felt through a very wide range of channels, which we will explore in this presentation. 
On the second question, we find that countries can really do stuff to make, uh, to attenuate these negative consequences of climate change. There is many policies that they can uh, put, uh, policies that they can implement, things that they can, you know, um, put in place to attenuate some of these negative consequences, but they cannot eliminate them. They cannot make themselves impervious to the fluctuations in weather. And if we look at you know, what scientists project is going to happen to temperatures going forward, we do find that you know, uh, if we focus on this one particular aspect of climate change, which is increases in temperature, low-income countries will most likely bear the brunt of the negative consequences of the projected increase in temperature. And I want to point out, you know, actually our study really focuses on fluctuations in temperature. We look a little bit at the effect of natural disasters, but the biggest focus of the chapter is on the fluctuations in temperatures. This, this is the, one of the, um, one of the um, uh, aspects of climate change on which there is pretty, um, a pretty solid agreement among scientists, you know, that temperatures is going to rise, and it's also one of the most easily measurable aspects of, cli of the climate. Okay, so to begin, let me just um, give out some of the kind of what are the key stylized facts about, you know, how uh, the weather has evolved over the past century and what scientists project may happen going forward. Um, over the past centuries, temperatures have been rising across the globe. And this has occurred really across all countries uh, in the world. Here we split the economies you know, in the way we tend to analyze them at the IMF. We look at the advanced emerging market and low-income countries. And we see that, you know, since uh, the 1900s, you know, temperatures have been on a rising trend, which has accelerated very significantly in the past 30, 40 years. And this acceleration is visible in, uh, in all country groups. The increase in temperature is much more pronounced in advanced economies. Um, but one thing that I want you to take away from this chart is if you look at the scale, you know, which gives us the average temperature um, in, uh, uh, in the different country groups, we see that the scales are very different. Low-income countries tend to be much, much hotter than advanced economies, um, something that we'll come back to throughout this presentation. As of 2015, the temperature in the average, the average annual temperature in the low-income countries was about 25 degrees Celsius, you know, which is more than twice the temperature in the average advanced economy, such as Germany or the U.S., which is about 11 degrees Celsius. The very rapid increase in temperature that happened in the last 30, 40 years is really coincided with um, rising greenhouse gases concentrations. Basic, basically, geosciences, uh, geoscientists um, suggest that you know, um, there are two key contributors to changing temperatures. Um, it could be due to natural factors, such as you know, volcanic activity, solar output, orbital changes, um, which is presented here in the light green line. This is, you know, what temperature increases we would predict based on how these natural factors have evolved in the past, you know, uh, 100 years. Or another contribution to uh, rising temperatures could be human factors, you know, land use, ozone emissions, and of course, what is um, we all know about and is a very big factor is greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions in particular. And basically, we see this chart, I think, is very, very telling uh, in depicting uh, that the key driver really seems to be uh, the rising greenhouse gas concentration. Basically, it's all due to human activity. And these emissions have increased, again, across the globe in all types of countries that we look at. Here in green, we have plotted them total emissions for advanced countries, highlighting some of the largest economies, such as the US, Germany, Japan. In the middle, we have emerging markets, where we see, again, a huge pickup in emissions with the very rapid economic growth in China. Um, and low-income countries, uh, where you know we see, again, a very substantial pickup in emissions. But again, I want to point out the scale. The scales are so different. Uh, basically, the emissions of low-income countries as a group are minuscule relative to what advanced and emerging markets are emitting. 
And you know, if you look on a per capita basis, um, advanced economies stand out even more. Even though they have been capable of kind of slowing the pace of increases in greenhouse gas emissions, as we saw in the previous chart, on a per capita basis, they are still contributing the very much, much more uh, than emerging markets. And low-income countries are again, uh, basically, their emissions are are, are pretty much negligible. Uh, going forward, significant warming is possible. Um, so we will rely on the International Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change produces various scenarios of what may happen to the Earth's um, temperature and precipitation based on various climatic models and assumptions of what will happen to greenhouse gas concentrations. And throughout the chapter, we take, you know, we, uh, we look in particular on two different scenarios. One is kind of an intermediate scenario in which countries do take very sizable actions to curb emissions. Basically, they continue rising up, up until the middle of the centuries, and then we really start, start to see significant cuts in emission. In such scenarios, scientists predict that temperature may rise by about 2 degrees centigrade. But in an unmitigated climate change scenario, where we basically just continue business as, as usual, um, we, will, we could see a very large increase in temperature, up, as I said, up, up close to 4 degrees centigrade. And um, there are very large uncertainties surrounding these forecasts here. I've, I've just given you a preview of what these models mean. You know, um, we take an average across, you know, many, many different models which are run for various climatic models uh, to come up with predictions of what will happen to average temperature. Uncertainties are very, very large around each prediction. But it could be very possible that we live in a totally different climatic regime. Uh, in which hot days could become very common. What we kind of played around with in this chart is we took the data for, for 2005 for the Earth as a whole, and we looked at, you know, if we split the 365 days into bins, how many days we experienced temperature of minus 5 to 0 Celsius, 10 to 15, and so on. This is basically what the distribution was in 2005. And if you look at the end of the century, uh, you know, what scientists predict may happen, this is what the distribution may look like in the unmitigated climate change scenario. We could be in a situation in which we spend a third of the year uh, with, uh, you know, daily temperature exceeding 30 degrees Celsius. So uh, very, very hot and uh, not very pleasant. Um, and uh, Professor Stemmler mentioned about the what will happen to natural disasters. Um, we try, we said disasters could indeed become uh, much more frequent. Um, scientists actually do not really forecast, you know, what exactly is going to happen in terms of natural disasters because disasters are somewhat different than extreme climate events. Uh, you know, disaster is defined when you have significant economic loss or loss of life, um, and so on. So if countries become really good at coping with extreme weather events, you may actually not have natural disasters. What we try to do is look at the historical experience. We looked at, you know, for each time, you know, we try to see whether there is a relationship between uh, temperature and precipitation in a particular location and the likelihood that a natural disaster will occur, disasters such as, you know, hurricanes that, you know, lead to significant economic damages or heat waves, wildfires, and so on. And we, uh, we examined data over the past three, four decades to tease out what is the relationship between temperature and the occurrence of a natural disaster. And then we used what scientists projected were, is going to happen to precipitation and temperature to see how the likelihood of disasters is going to change going forward. And we do find that, you know, um, uh, the probability of disasters is going to rise, um, you know, um, and this is going to happen both for advanced emerging market and low income countries and across a very wide, wide range of different types of disasters that we examined here. We've just given three as an examples. Now, getting to kind of the main um, analysis of, of, uh, of our studies, which of our studies, which is how do weather shocks affect economic activity? 
So as I said, there were three questions that we tried to address. First, the macroeconomic impact, the impact on growth. Second, what is the role of policies? Can various policies that countries undertake reduce these negative consequences? And third, what may be the potential impact of projected global warming? We, um, we take three different kind of uh, analytical strategies to try to answer this question. To answer the first question, we look at the historical experience. We, you know, we do empirical analysis. We look at data from the past, you know, 65 years across 180 countries uh, to try to see what has been the relationship in the data between the level of temperature or the amount of rain that, that you know, a country receives and its economic performance. Uh, this is also going to be the analysis that we use to look at what has been the role of policies. But in order to tease out what is the you know, potential impact of global warming, we will switch to kind of a model-based approach uh, in which we will plug our empirical estimates to kind of project over the next 100 years how the whole economy responds in order to estimate, you know, calculate the economic damages from climate change. And finally, I may not get to this in this presentation, but um, but in the in the chapter we look at very we have some case studies of successful uh, adaptation policy uh, adaptation strategies that different countries have undertaken to deal with weather shocks and climate change. So let's look at at the first part, the empirical analysis. So I'm not really going to bore you with this slide, but. Um, uh, very quick, quickly, what you know, what we are, what we, what we have here is we look at the economic growth in a particular country, uh, which is kind of our the variable that we are trying to explain, and we see whether this is related to the temperature, the annual temperature that the country experiences in this year, the precipitation that it gets, controlling for all the kind of. Uh, characteristics of the country that do not vary over time, as well as, you know, all the shocks that affect all countries in a particular year. So we use data, as I said, over, you know, since 1950. Um, the weather data is interesting because, um, you know, what scientists give us is they kind of take the data from various weather stations that country have that are spread across the world in not very even manner. Uh, they use their climate models, they take data from satellites, and they combine all of this and they give you for each, you know, they divide the Earth into this grid, you know, of like, let's say, 20 by 20 mile grid. And they give you for each one of these little, you know, um, parts of the Earth, what has been the temperature and precipitation for a particular month. So we take all of this data and we and we put it back together to match it to the country uh, where these different grids are located. Uh, and this is how we bridge, you know, what the, uh, the unit of analysis that scientists have, which is, you know, that this uh, location on Earth and the economic uh, unit that we tend to analyze, which is the country. Um, so we allow the relationship between economic growth, economic activity, and the weather variables, which, as I said, are measured as the average annual temperature and precipitation to be nonlinear. And uh, in doing so, we built on a very influential study that came out in Nature uh, by uh, uh, Berg, Siang, and Miguel. Um, that had kind of uncovered for a smaller sample of uh, set of countries and, you know, sl slightly, you know, smaller number of years that there may be this uh, nonlinear relationship between the two. And what we find is, uh, indeed, we confirm this uh, nonlinear relationship that exists between economic activity and temperature. We do not find a very re robust relationship between the amount of rain that comes that, that a country receives in a year and its economic performance. But for temperature, it is indeed very striking. So I will put it in a more uh, intuitive way in a minute. But we do see that you know at low levels of temperature, an increasing temperature actually boosts economic activity. This is why we have this positive coefficient on the temperature term. So you know, if it's basically if you're in Siberia and temperatures rise by a little bit, it may actually be good for growth in that region. Maybe, you know, you will be able to farm like a, a, a wider set of crops and so on. 
However, at higher levels of temperature, an increase in, you know, in temperature actually will hurt economic activity. And there is this optimal temperature of about 13 to 15 degrees Celsius, which is optimal for economic activity. And this coincidentally is, you know, the temperature, the average annual temperature in the United States and Germany in very, very of some of the richer countries in the world. Um, as I said, these findings are incredibly robust. We looked at very many different sources of weather data because it's not just, you know, one set of scientists that has tried to put together and construct this uh, weather data for, you know, uh, the Earth as a whole. Uh, we examined very, dif very different sources. Uh, we looked at very different sources of um, economic growth data. Um, we, we looked at subnational, you know, anything we do, uh, this was a very, very robust finding. Uh, so what does this mean? What this relationship means? Um, so what we plot in this chart is kind of the mark uh, in the blue line that kind of goes diagonally is we have the impact, the marginal impact of a one degree Celsius increase in the temperature. And on the X axis, you know, is the temperature in a particular country because it says because the relationship is nonlinear, how an increase in temperature affects you depends crucially on whether you're a hot country or cool, cold country, whether you're above this optimal temperature of 13 to 15 degrees Celsius or below. Um, so we see that, you know, in, if you're a very cold country, the effect is positive. And if you, you know, move past the 13 to 15 degree, the effect becomes negative. And, it, you know, these uh, dotted lines indicate the, the confidence interval. So at some point, you know, this effect becomes statistically significantly uh, negative. Um, and what we have plotted here to just give an illustration is with the advanced economies. You know, we have plotted the distribution of advanced economies across the different temperatures. So, you know, we see that about, you know, 10, 12 percent of advanced economies happen to have temperature of about 11 degrees Celsius. And we see how, how this distribution is across, um, um, across, you know, across temperature. And what is very interesting to see is that uh, for the median advanced economies, which is, you know, the, you know this thing in, which has, happens to have a temperature of about 11 degrees Celsius, there is no discernible effect of weather. Like a small increase in temperature is not really going to affect, you know, output in the U.S. or in Germany or a country that has on average this type of temperature. However, things changed very dramatically if we look at a different set of countries. Now, let's plot emerging markets and see, you know, how, um, how the effect of an increase in temperature, uh, how, how they will experience that. And emerging markets and developing emerging markets in particular are substantially hotter countries. They just happen to be located in hotter parts of the planet. Uh, so for the median country, which is again where we have this vertical red bar, um, we, the median country happens to have temperature of about 22 degrees uh, Celsius, um, a one degree increase in temperature lowers output by about 1%. Okay, this is what happens in the, in the year in which the increase in temperature occurs. And if we look at low-income countries, they happen to be even hotter. They happen to be located in even hotter places. Think of, you know, all of the countries in Africa and, you know, other tro tropics and subtropics. Their average temperature is about 25 degrees Celsius, um, you know, with countries that are even hotter than that. Quite, we have quite a sizable mass above that. And for them, the negative effect of an increase in temperature is even deeper. In sum, so we can put all of these results together and, you know, for each country, and not only for each country, but for each of those, you know, little, uh, uh, little grids of the art, we can compute what would be the, you know, according to our empirical estimates, what would be the effect of a one degree increase in temperature. And this is what we have plotted. Um, so what would be the increase on the per capita GDP, the thing that we, that we care about. We see that, you know, again, in the very north, there is this part of the earth where this will be beneficial, you know, pretty sizable increases. So one degree could actually boost economic output, GDP per capita by 4%. But, you know, there's big chunks of the earth. And then there is, you know, 
kind of the vast majority of the US and in Europe where the effect is indistinguishable from zero. Basically, there is not much of an effect. We have colored these in, in gray. And you know, in the countries in the tropics and subtropics, we see a very, uh, you know, very a lot of red, a very, you know, um, uh, very negative effects. And you may think, well, you know, but a big, you know, the green doesn't seem like it's a very small part of the earth. Um, it so happens that uh, you know it's not where many people live. So what we have done here, we have reshaped each country based on the number of people that live in that country. And now what we, what we see is that you know, the places that would benefit from an increase in temperature are places where pretty much very, very few people currently reside, and where 60% uh, you know, of the world resides currently uh, are the places where we'll see very large negative effects of an increase in temperature. OK, so basically, the adverse consequences of temperature increases happen to be concentrated in precisely the places where most of the population of the world lives. These are not economically very significant places. They produce about only 20% of the world economic output currently. But they, they're home to about 60% of the population. Um, what we have discussed so far is kind of the contemporaneous effect of an incre of increases in temperature. You know what happens in the year in which uh, in which temperature rises. But what is interesting to know is like, does the country recover fast, or is this effect long lasting? And what they have plotted in this chart is how you know per capita GDP reacts to an increase in or, uh, in temperature at, at time zero. You know, so so far we had only discussed this effect that happens at time zero, but we looked seven years afterwards. Does economic activity bounce back, or does it stay depressed? And we have done it again for the typical advanced economy, which has you know temperature of 11 degrees Celsius, the typical emerging market, and the typical low income countries. And what is very striking is that these effects are very, very long lasting. Even seven years down the road, you see uh, that economic output is depressed relative to what it would have been in the absence of the increase in temperature. So that's something that is, uh, that is pretty puzzling. Now, there's a lot of uh, literature out there. I mean, agronomists, you know, have studied, you know, um, the impact of, you know, optimal conditions, optimal weather for uh, different crops and so on. So in some sense, we were expecting that this effect will be really driven by what happens to the agricultural sector, right? I mean, if uh, it's really hot, if there is a drought, you know, a lot of crops may fail and so on. So, but you know, in many countries, agriculture is not anymore a very large share of GDP. So what we, what we did is we examined, you know, kind of the effect of these temperature shocks on the different um, output, the output of the agricultural sector in each country, the manufacturing output of the, output of the manufacturing uh, sector and the output of, of the services sector. And what we, we find is that basically the output of the services sector is pretty much not affected by changes in temperature. You know, we see that this line, you know, is, uh, you know, it's a little bit below zero, but, you know, it's not statistically different from zero. We do see the very large negative effect on the agricultural output, you know, kind of confirming, you know, years of research of agronomists that have, you know, done the very, you know, very, various experiments on how temperature affects um, agricultural productivity. But what is, uh, what is surprising for us that even things like manufacturing is actually affected by an increase in temperature. And, uh, you know, this was, this was pretty puzzling to us. So then we try to tackle this question in a different way. If you think of how the GDP in a country is done, how output is, is produced, basically you have two factors of production. This is, you know, what we think is capital and labor on one hand. And then, you know, the other main ingredient into, you know, the output that the country produces is how efficiently it is able to combine these different inputs, the productivity. 
so we try, you know, and these are all things that economists measure. You know, we have data on these or proxies of this in, in you know, a very imperfect way across a large number of countries and over time. So we looked, we tried to examine each one in particular. Do we see that the weather affects productivity? Does it affect capital formation? You know, how much investments countries are being, how much capital they're accumulating? Or does it affect labor? Like people, us, you know, how we are able to actually work. So to look at the effect of productivity, um, what, we, what we zoomed into is, is um, pretty finely defined sectoral data. And um, the idea is that if uh, temperature increases affect GDP per capita, the, the GDP of a country, predominantly through the productivity channel, then we should see that this effect will be much more pronounced in sectors of the economy which are more exposed to the weather, such as sectors where a lot of the production happens to take place outside and, you know, it's ex exposed to temperature relative to sectors where, you know, uh, a lot of the production happens indoors and it's protected from, from the weather. So uh, we found this data that gives us the production, you know, um, the productivity per worker um, across, you know, pretty finely disaggregated sectors. And basically we could, we could sort them, you know, into how exposed they are to the weather. So sectors like construction or agriculture or, you know, uh, will, be, um, uh, will be considered exposed to the weather while a lot of things that are performed indoors, such as, you know, educational services or public administration, basically a lot of the services sector are the ones that are not, you know, performed outside. Uh, manufacturing um, tends to be, uh, uh, you know, in especially in a lot of emerging market and developing countries, it is typically takes place indoors. But in many of these places, there is no access to air conditioning, and a lot of manufacturing processes actually generate a lot of heat. So, you know, uh, people tend to classify them as exposed to the weather. So what we have plotted here is the effect of an increase in temperature first in red line is on these sectors that are not exposed to the weather, what they're classified as not exposed to the weather. And we see that there's basically zero relationship. It's, it's, it can, it's exactly zero, the estimated coefficient of how productivity per worker in this sector reacts to, um, to temperature. But in, you know, in hot countries, you know, such as the emerging market and low-income countries, we see very large negative effects on labor productivity in, you know, for workers who work in sectors that typically take place out, outdoors, such as, you know, as I said, agriculture, fishery, far farming, and in, in construction, and so on. Um, and this, you know, has not been documented, you know, in like a cross-country study like that, but there is a lot of um, actually very micro literature and experimental studies that have looked at both how, you know, human performs on cognitive and physical tasks and how this is related to, to, to temperature. And there was actually a very nice study done pretty recently about New York, uh, New York schools. And they looked at, you know, um, schools that didn't have air conditioning, how the scores, test scores of students varied based on what was the temperature uh, out, outside. And there was a very strong negative correlation, you know, uh, not negative, but, you know, if the temperature is above a certain, you know, threshold, students tend to perform a lot worse, uh, you know, uh, on uh, when they take their math test and, and so on. It was a very recent study from, from New York. Um, but this was, has been done also for, you know, physical tasks and so on. So, but it's remarkable to see it in the cross-country data as well. So we did see some effect on labor productivity. We also looked at investment. Um, so this is data that comes from, you know, countries actually do, you know, report to the IMF how much the country as a whole invests, you know, gross capital formation, how much they put aside. The very kind of macro measure. And we do find that an increase in uh, temperature tends to depress investment 
in already hot, uh, hot countries. Um, the effect hap seems to happen with the lag, presumably because investment decision is something that you plan in advance and you don't, you know, um, change uh, the year of a shock. But you know, uh, it, it, we see this very long-lasting, you know, negative effect uh, years down the road. And one way to think about it for me, it was kind of hard to imagine, like, why would investment, you know, uh, be affected from an increase in temperature. And I was thinking, I spent a lot of time in India, you know, I'm thinking of a typical subsistence farmer who basically has very little access to formal savings or, you know, to credit instruments. And, you know, imagine, you know, it's really a very hot year. The crop fails. One of the key, you know, the key capital that this farmer may have may be a bullock like a, a, or a cow. And, you know, they may have to, you know, sell that cow, basically, which would be exactly recorded as a reduction in your capital stock. Um, in order to kind of weather this shock and in order for, to feed their family. Um, and that would have very long lasting effects on their livelihood for years to come because it's not like next year they will have enough money to buy a new, um, a new, a new cow or a new bullock. And uh, finally, we looked at a very imperfect proxy of um, labor. You know, in our production function, we had productivity, capital, and labor. Um, you know, very imperfect proxy of what would be, you know, kind of how our health is affected. We need something that's available for a large number of countries um, for a long time period. And the only kind of comparable thing that we can find is infant mortality, which is collected by, uh, by the World Bank. And we do see uh, kind of a significant increase in infant mortality uh, in hot places when temperature rise. Um, of course, in advanced economies, none of these effects um, uh, are evident. Um, and again, you know, this is a very long-lasting effect, uh, presumably working through the fact that, you know, you have these economic shocks, mothers that, you know, women that may be pregnant have poorer, you know, because of the loss of income, may have access to poor nutrition and so on that has, you know, long lasting effects on, on the kids they give birth to and, and so on. Now, if we see that there has been this very, uh, you know, negative effects, you know, for um, countries in hot, with hot climates of, you know, these fluctuations in weather, we would think that countries over time will learn how to deal with them. So if this is indeed true, we would expect that, you know, if you look at what was the effect of weather shocks in the 50s um, for countries relative to what is the effect of weather shocks on these countries' economies in recent years, you know, we should expect the effect to have gone down over time. Uh, and this, the economy's output to become less sensitive to weather fluctuations. But we actually see no evidence that this has happened. Here we have plotted uh, the, um, uh, the estimated effect, you know, if we just do it for each 20-year period you estimated. Um, and we basically see that it's very, very stable over time. Uh, for the average, for the median low-income countries, an increase in temperature basically always leads to about 1% loss of, uh, of GDP. All right, so what has been, you know, what can uh, policies do to help, can policies help countries deal with these uh, weather shocks and kind of uh, minimize the economic damage from increases in temperatures? And before, you know, for us it was, you know, what can, it was hard to think of what can countries do? What is kind of the two kit that they have at their disposal to deal with this with these shocks and you know we thought of splitting them into two bins kind of with blue you know are kind of very traditional macroeconomic policies structural policies that countries have at their disposal that make, makes them more resilient to any type of shock be it you know an exchange rate shock or commodity price shock you know, presumably it would help them with to deal with um, with a weather shock. And these are very kind of um, things that, you know, places like the IMF tend to recommend to countries that you know, they should try to build 
buffers, for example, they should the government should have enough, uh, you know, should have a strong fiscal balance so that, you know, if a shock occurs, they can, you know, help uh, agents, they can help households, they can deliver aid um, to their households. So have, you know, uh, whether they have safety nets, whether they can, you know, whether there is a way to deliver this aid to households that may have lost their crop in a really bad, bad year. Or there may be policies that kind of make the, in general, the economy more flexible, um, you know, and kind of allows, you know, capital and labor to reallocate, reallocate across different sectors, such as, you know, uh, countries that have more educated labor, labor, uh, more, more educated population, that have more flexible labor market policies, uh, like deeper financial markets so that households can borrow more easily in the face of a shock. And on the other side, you know, that we thought that climate change and, you know, weather shocks may require some very, very specific adaptation strategies. It's not just the usual very general macroeconomic policies that we have in mind, such as, you know, which, which aim to mitigate the very specific risks of um, weather shocks, such as, for example, uh, you know, strengthening building codes and zone, zoning laws, uh, investing in new technologies, for example, developing crop resistant, you know, heat resistant crops and things like that, building infrastructure that is resilient to climate change. Um, all of these that are very, very micro, you know, uh, very specific for the particular climate change risk that countries um, that countries deal with. And, you know, our uh, chapter sheds more light on kind of the blue part, which we can examine empirically because these are things that are easily measurable. But we do provide some case studies and examples of how countries have dealt using some of these other strategies, uh, very specific uh, climate change adaptation strategies. Um, and what we find is, you know, we do find that there is evidence that availability of buffers and po policies that enhance, in general, the flexibility of an economy can help in co countries to deal with weather shocks as well. So what this chapter plots here, what is what is said, the figures plot here, is in blue is the effect of an increase in uh, temperature on GDP per capita for a country that has kind of the good policy, let's say, you know, for example, it has very strong fiscal position or it has, you know, receives a lot of foreign aid. And in red is like for a country that does not have that characteristic. Um, and, you know, what we have when it's shaded in gray, it means that the difference between these two lines is statistically different, uh, statistically different. So this policy really is not just a fluke of the data, but, you know, um, it is, um, it may be, it may be, um, it may be a real difference between these two sets of countries, countries with different characteristics. So it's not overwhelming evidence, but we do see that, for example, the buffers, which is, you know, to what extent you can really respond to the shock before, because you have the money to, to, uh, to give out, you know, to affected households, uh, tends to make the initial um, impact of an increase in weather somewhat less. The blue line tends to be, you know, uh, above the red line. But over time, we do not see that these countries, you know, the long-term effect seems to be very similar. Uh, regardless of whether the country has buffers or not. And for this, you know, policies that enhance the flexibility of the economy and kind of overall level of development, uh, we do see that they seem to take more of a, um, uh, more of a difference in the long-term effect of climate change, of, of, of weather shock. We see that these countries, you know, seven years down the line, the economic loss is significantly smaller. But in no case do we see that they're completely able to make countries, um, you know, completely independent and completely impervious to these weather shocks. Um, I'm going to skip that. Um, what other strategies that countries, you know, that individuals have to deal with climate change when they see, you know, that, you know, okay, well, this place, you know, I cannot really grow my crops here anymore. Basically, they may decide to relocate. This is kind of, you know, 
the ultimate strategy of dealing with, uh, you know, with these adverse um, uh, shocks. And we do examine this channel because it has very important uh, global, you know, uh, spillovers across countries. Uh, and it was something that, you know, people were very concerned um, about whether, you know, it is really, you know, these climatic conditions that may in the end fuel a very large waves of migrants from countries that will become pretty much inhabitable. Um, to advanced economies. And uh, what we have, uh, we do find some evidence that um, uh, that migration, emigration, people do tend, do tend to move out of a place um, uh, in uh, response to increases in temperature as well as in response to natural disasters. But an interesting and somewhat kind of sad thing is that it only happens if you know individuals reside in slightly more developed places like emerging markets. It does not happen if you're in low-income countries, which suggests that people there may be you know so poor that they're really trapped. They don't even have the resources to get out and move uh, move out of these places. Um, so I'm not really going to go. Maybe later on we can talk about some of the case studies of successful adaptation um, strategies. But since I'm running out of time, um, I wanted to highlight that you know we do find evidence that adaptation is possible. Um, you know it can attenuate some of the effects, but adaptation is very very challenging, and it is especially challenging for low-income countries. What we have in this chart is. Um, a score that the University of Notre Dame has put together of the adaptation capacity of each country. And we have plotted that against what we estimate is the effect of a one degree increase in temperature. And you know, we have color coded the countries in red are the low income countries, in orange are the emerging markets, and in blue are the advanced economies. And uh, you know, what we see is that all the low-income countries tend to be concentrated in this lower left corner. So not only do they have the worst effects of an increase in temperature, but those, there's also the countries that score very low in terms of their adaptation capacity. Um, the impact of global warming, um, what we do is we take these estimates that we found about the historical relationship between an increase in temperature and economic activity. And we plug them into a dynamic uh, general equilibrium model, um, you know, to, in order to see over the next 100 years if we take, you know, what scientists project will happen uh, in terms of increasing temperature for, you know, a representative low-income country, what would be effect on the GDP per capita of this, of this country. It requires a lot of very brave assumptions. You know, probably most of them are not really very realistic. Uh, a lot of choices. So, you know, this, you know, we really need to take with a grain of salt, but for illustrative purposes. Uh, here, you know, we have plotted what we project may happen uh, to per capita GDP for up, up until the end of a century for kind of a representative low income countries under the two scenarios that I talked about. One in which we have, you know, countries really try to curb CO2 emissions, and one in which the extreme scenario where we have unmitigated climate change. And we basically see that in the unmitigated climate change scenario, the losses could be pretty sizable with very, again, very large uncertainty uh, about what these losses will be. And if we do this for the world as a whole, and again, we plotted what could be the, the the effects, you know. Again, we see, you know, in red, um, you know, many, m much, many more parts of the world now become red because, you know, little by little, even some parts of the advanced economies we warm up significantly above this optimal temperature, and further increases uh, is gonna is gonna affect them as well. So to summarize. Um, what we find is that temperature shocks have very uneven macroeconomic effects across countries and even within countries. You know, you know, certain parts of the U.S. even will be very, very adversely affected. We do find that these negative effects are concentrated in low-income countries. We find that this effect of increases in temperature operates through many, numerous channels, 
it affects agricultural output, but also it depresses productivity of workers exposed to heat, it reduces investment, and it has adverse health consequences, as we saw with the results on infant mortality. We do not see much evidence that the sensitivity of output to weather shock has changed over time, which, you know, does not really bode well for a country's ability to adapt. Um, and if we take our, you know, empirical estimates and we put them in the model, we would, uh, you know, it implies that climate change could have pretty sizable economic losses for most low-income countries. Um, we do find that policies, domestic policies can help. So, you know, low-income countries are not entirely left on their own. They can, you know, do something to help themselves. Uh, but, you know, we have to be realistic about how much uh, they can really do uh, because, you know, they often are countries that with very severely limited resources. Um, they will suffer a very disproportionate share of the economic damage of, of uh, the economic damages of of um, climate change. The, as we saw, they have the least capacity to adapt. And, you know, they actually have contributed very, very little to global warming. So in some sense, they're really the victim of something um, uh, that, that they really had nothing to do with. So which brings us to the last point that the international community will have to play and must play a very key role in helping countries, both low-income countries, but all countries cope with climate change. This is justifiable both from an equity standpoint of view, because indeed they were the ones that contributed the most to this problem. Uh, but it's also justifiable from an efficiency standpoint of view, because it will help them internalize this negative externality that they are exerting on, um, on their own and for, for, for other countries. Um, but in the end, you know, um, as we said, all policies, you know, can only go so far in helping countries cope with climate change. So we really need to continue um, trying to curb emissions and trying to kind of stem uh, temperature increases. That's kind of the only way that we can deal with uh, the issue. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, now, let me uh, explain what we have planned now. Um, this was a, a wonderful uh, presentation of recent research of the IMF. And the IMF was not always uh, on the side of the losers of this world, uh, but recently they have become more and more, have recently studied more and more also the losers of the globalization, the losers of uh, economic uh, welfare increase the losers of growth and one of the uh, very important study is here also as you can see the impact on uh, uh, low income countries the impact of uh, climate change and weather disasters and their uh, very limited capacity to react and um, now what we have planned is so to speak some remarks and comments from another expert in this area, and oh, I have to go there. You might think that it all looks pretty gloomy and dark, what you see there uh, coming. Now, um, I had, was lucky uh, to have one other expert here just at the moment in New York, who is traveling around the globe, and this is Prem Chanka Ja. He wrote a book on dawn of solar age. So, and I asked him, well, you don't seem to be so pessimistic. No, he says, well, this is a great opportunity now for developing economies for low income and for emerging market countries. So and this must be a very provocative uh, hypothesis. And uh, we uh, would like to listen to his explanation there. And I just want to introduce you to Prem Chakra. Yeah, he is an economist, writer, and journalist, mostly working in India, but he is visiting a lot of Western, West uh, European, uh, European and American uh, institutions and uh, uh, universities. Oh, he was in Oxford and Harvard and Indian Institute of uh, Management. 
He was a former member of the energy panel of the World Commission on Environment and Development, which had some input in the Rio summit. And he was former advisor of the Prime Minister of um, uh, India and um, Energy Journalist of the Year Award winner of the International Association of Energy Economics. So a very active uh, person on the climate front. And you will see some very interesting hypotheses now. So welcome to the new school. Okay. Thank you really for that. Um, introduction, which is far more than I deserve. And it here for a, for a truly magnificent presentation. Uh, I'm very glad that the IMF is doing this kind of work, bringing to us the, the, the hard truth of where the world is going without any kind of attempt to cloak it or to soft, soft to sort of swaddle it in, 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 in good wishes. <clears throat> yes, I believe very strongly that the uh, everything that Peter said about the the lowest income country and, and the emerging market com uh, countries being the worst sufferers is absolutely true. But at the same time, if you want to, to get out of the trap of global warming, then in fact, it is these precisely these countries which hold the answers. Uh, how does one change to the next? One just clicks on something, does one? Oh, oh here, OK, fine. Sorry, thank you. <clears throat> the IMF study has been based on the assumption, it's implicit, in fact, it's quite explicit, that there's only so much you can do to reduce global warming because it is not really easy, or even possible perhaps within this century, to move out of fossil fuels altogether. Uh, I strongly disagree with this presumption. And I wish to tell you, I'll go on to tell you why. Um, first and foremost, the, the biggest question is, is there another source of energy which is sufficiently abundant to replace fossil fuels, which, of, for which we have now a truly gargantuan appetite? The answer is there is only one source left in the universe, and that is the sun itself. I think you all know that. Um, <clears throat> sun's energy comes to us every day of the year in four forms, as light, as visible light, as heat, infrared waves, as wind, and as biomass. Wind and biomass are indirect forms in which the sun's energy reach, is, is, becomes available to us. Light and heat are direct. <clears throat> Wind and solar photovoltaic power, that is to say the light part of the sun, uh, sun's energy, is, are being extensively you know, uh, sort of developed just now. But I'm afraid, and there are sort of very strong sort of hopes that this, these two, either singly or to, well, together particularly, will be able to meet most of the needs, will enable us to shift a large part of our, of, of our energy consumption out of fossil fuels. <clears throat> I um, think that this is not going to be possible. Wind power potential is limited although the, 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 the amount of wind is enormous, the power in the wind, but we can only use the wind which is within about 200 meters at most of the Earth's surface, and this is about only one twelfth of the total uh, you know, kinetic energy in wind. Uh, by the time that you have brought this down through various stages to where they turn turbines and gener generate electricity, you get a sort of the second law of thermodynamics works so so far, that you really don't get a lot of energy left, and then you have the problem of where will you put the wind, wind, wind farms. So there is a limit there. This solar photovoltaic has another different kind of limit, which is that the materials that are required are very rare, rare metals, the tellurium, um, <clears throat> cadmium, and lithium, and 
there just simply isn't enough on, on, in, in the Earth's crust to really enable you to do any kind of significant transfer out of fossil fuels uh, on, you know, in, 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 into solar photovoltaic, uh, out of, let's say, coal, coal power into solar photo, photo, photovoltaic power, without, in fact, creating huge crises of supply and skyrocketing prices, which knock you out of the market again. Um, but the most important weakness of wind and solar is that the supply is intermittent. And in the case of wind, it's also variable. And what the world needs is continuous power on demand as much as we want, whenever we want. That baseload power is simply not possible. And while people keep talking about doing it all by marrying smart grids and all that, believe you me, every study I've seen of the smart grids has assumed that 20% of the power will have to come from fossil fuels from now for the, forever, forevermore. And that, and that, in that basis, of course, uh, we, you know, we, we don't have a future. <clears throat> the capacity to re replace fossil fuels completely resides actually in the two remaining forms of solar energy, heat and biomass. And these, as I don't have to tell you, are the ones that are almost never talked about, almost never written about, almost, almost unknown. Let me start with solar thermal power first. Uh, so the sun's heat can, can be trapped and is being trapped in an increasing number of power plants today. Let me just move on. <clears throat> to, uh, to, uh, to, to generate electricity. And they have a huge number of advantages. They require no rare, rare metals or chemicals, so prices remain unaffected. They use the same turbines and ancillary equipment as conventional power stations, so you don't knock large chunks of, of the engineering, engineering um, world you know, out of business. Um, they generate huge amounts of process heat for industrial use, solar photovoltaic does not. And you need then to replace it. If you're going to go from coal-based power to, 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 what do you call it, to say photovoltaic or wind power, you'll have to find another source for heat. Otherwise, industry will not work. <clears throat> but the most greatest advantage of uh, solar thermal power, um, which of course, Look, I suppose all of you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about concentrated solar thermal power. Shine mirrors at a, set, at, at, at a particular point where there is a, a, a fluid that you heat to very high temperatures. Use that to produce steam, and that steam then runs turbines. The, <clears throat> the, the greatest advantage of solar thermal power is that they, that those power stations can and are running at night. There's a plant, there's a solar power plant in Spain that has been running for six years at 75% capacity, 75% of the year, 6,500 hours per year. And there are a large number of others that have come up with varying, varying, varied levels of storage. The storage is possible very cheaply in solar, in solar thermal power because you can so, store the heat uh, generated, uh, trapped from the sun during the day as molten salt. And molten salt in well-constructed storage tanks uh, has been found, the, the particular combination that is now in use, has been found to lose not only about one, one to two percent of its heat in 24 hours. So that is available at any time, and, and even if there's a temporary drop in the daytime, it can be made up by just increasing the amount of, of um, salt, uh, the, the liquid tra transferred from the, from the reserve tanks. <clears throat> the technology is simple, it's easy to master, and easy to maintain. Above all, and here we come to the first of the places where I show you how this benefits people and begins to reverse the, 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 the decline that Petya described, is that it requires, so, so solar thermal power plants require a fair amount of land. 
But it's desert or arid or semi-arid land, which is two thirds of the world, by the way. And this land has few alternate uses. The people who dwell on it are the poorest and the most vulnerable to weather anomalies, as we just heard. <clears throat> what they get is a substantial and constant source of income and increased employ in employment, especially as industry moves there to take advantage of the process heat generated by the, the CSP plants. For the country, there's a saving of foreign exchange on energy imports. Look at Morocco, which has put up a 540 megawatt solar, uh, solar uh, thermal power plant, which has come, come on stream this year. And it's meeting most of its energy, 58%, I think, of its energy needs now from that one plant. <clears throat> it was in, it, it, importing almost 90% of energy before. <clears throat> then the earning, then there's the Morocco intends, for example, to ex export from the next three plants that it builds, next two plants. Uh, and they in, intend to export the energy, the, the, the electricity to Europe. So you get earnings from exports. And finally, for oil importing developing countries, immediately and for those dependent upon coal later on, you get shielding from the shocks of inflation, which are very destructive politically and socially within your country. <clears throat> One other benefit that nobody talks about, and I'm glad I have talked about it in my book, is that solar thermal power plants, because they can give you both base load and peak load power, peak power, do away, with, do away with the need for both nuclear power plants and hydropower plants, which are very destructive and also not entirely safe. Um, <clears throat> I have done some calculations in my, in, in my, in, in my book, and I'm sure that there are much better ones available if you, if you look around. Um, but and I, I rather, I have not done. I have, I have presented um, some studies. Um, and they show that the cost of a solar thermal power plant today is considerably less than that of either nuclear or hydro. What is more, it, comes, it becomes available within two to three years as against between eight and 12 years minimum for, 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 solar, for, for nuclear and hydro power plants. Now, I just come to biomass. I think this is even more important. Biomass can replace oil and gas as the feedstock for the production of all transport fuels and petrochemicals. It can do so, it does so, it's, to some extent it is doing so, through either fermentation or gasification. There are two processes. Fermentation is being used today to produce ethanol. And as you know, ethanol mixture is common all over the world now, with, with, with you know, your green gasoline. But it cannot replace gasoline in its entirety because it requires food crops, and, and, and therefore it conflicts with human con consumption. Attempts to produce cellulosic eth ethanol from the stalks and other waste materials, crop wastes, for example, have been going on for 20 years, and they have led, given you precisely zero results. I believe there's one small commercial plant that came up last year in Brazil, and that's about as far as we've got. <clears throat> Biomass gasification is the other technology, and that technology gives you only, it, it, it basically, it's the com combustion of any biomass in a limited supply of air or oxygen, which instead of giving you only carbon dioxide, gives you also carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Carbon monoxide and hydrogen are the basic, basic building blocks of the entire petrochemicals industry, of organic chemistry, in fact, and can uh, give you every transport fuel, as well as every petrochemical that is being used today, that's being produced today. In fact, all of these are being produced with carbon monoxide and hydrogen obtained by cracking either oil or natural gas. You first crack them to get carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Here you, 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 you gasify the biomass and you get the same thing, and you, can, you use that, and the rest of the technology is the same. One important thing I want you to realize is, both in solar thermal and in, and, and in biomass technology, bi, bio, bi, biomass gasification technology, the technologies you need have been around for between 40 and 100 years. The first plant that turned municipal solid waste into methanol came up in the USA in 1922, 1922. 
The technology has been known, it's been forgotten, and it's time that we thought about these, these again. Now, every form, unlike fermentation, and here again the advantages I'm going to do it and then I conclude, and unlike fermentation, any and every form of bi biomass can be gasified. This means that every crop residue and even garbage ceases to be a waste product and becomes an extremely valuable substitute for fossil fuels. So conflict between producing food for humans and animals, and yes, that's just about right, thank you, and, uh, and animals, but producing food and producing food for transport fuels, that disappears and is replaced by synergy, where agriculture produces both. <clears throat> one, addition, one immediate benefit of, the, of this whole crop utilization, as it's called, is that it protects far farmers in the most vulnerable areas of the world from famine caused by drought. Because when there is a drought, the food part of the crop is the first to go. But the stalks and things remain. They may be a little, they may be smaller. Um, you, you may find that the, the grain has not come, as I've seen myself in famines I've covered in India. Uh, but, this, but the rice is, ri rice, rice is still standing, or the wheat is still standing. Um, now, that part of the, of, the, of the crop now becomes actually, I've done some calculations, more valuable as a transport fuel than, than, than the food that you would, you're selling. And what this means is that there's, for farmers, there's two things. If one, if you get both, well and good. But if you don't, you at least have one to sell regardless of, of almost regardless of weather conditions. I can imagine a drought so severe that even the stalks don't grow and nothing grows. Yes, that happens. But the point is, the areas where that happens are very small compared to the areas that are routinely hit and ravaged and, and devastated by drought. <clears throat> Now, you can imagine what this would mean to farmers in, Africa, in, in the Sahel or in, in, in Western China or Southern India and Pakistan. Pakistan. It, it, it's, it would be the, it's the most powerful insurance you can ever think of. And at the same time, it solves your, 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 your fossil, your, your, your helps you to, to deal with, 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 with climate change. Most important, there are no more famines. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's very positive outlook, and thank you both for the excellent presentations. What we want to do now, uh, the two speakers may go here, and then uh, maybe uh, you can, if you want, to respond to each other uh, for a few minutes, and then we open up the floor and you can ask questions. Yeah? You want to yeah, please sit down, and then I don't want to sit here somewhere. So. Uh, then I will later call for some other questions. All right. So you want to respond briefly to each other? To uh, sure. Yeah. I think I, I think your presentation was absolutely fascinating, and I I really hope that this is true. <laughs> and uh, how do we turn it on? It's on already. Okay. Yes, and and I really hope because it paints a much. Uh, mm. Must be a drop here. Is that it? Is it on now? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah it, it paints a much uh, brighter future. I mean, my key question is, if these technologies are around, why aren't they used? Like, why have they been forgotten? What's the market for them? Is it, uh, you know, how can they? Well, they haven't been entirely forgotten. Um, to, but several things have come in the way of their being used. First, the solar thermal power plants actually came up before solar photovoltaic. Mm -hmm. uh, the, first, the first solar thermal power plants were built in California. There were nine of them, which are now run by a company called Bright Source Engineering, and they're still very much producing power. Um, and, and that was in the 1980s. Uh, the, 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 the thing is that your, <clears throat> sorry, Tell me your question again. Why have they not been used? Yes, why are yeah. they not being used currently? Uh, yes. In between, there was this dramatic drop 
in uh, the price of, of solar photovoltaic. And it, you have to understand the nature of the market. The market will go. You see, we have, after all, a competitive capitalist economic system. Uh, well, that market economy, capitalist, it doesn't really matter what, word, what phrase you use. But it's driven by profit. And it's driven particularly nowadays by profit as examined and, and, and forecast by analysts who make three monthly forecasts. So it's short term profit. You, and the, the, there, the, the returns on, on how quickly they come is as important as what the returns themselves are. So with the crash in prices that took place and the tremendous increase in, in efficiency with the uh, emergence of thin film technology, which in fact uses all these very rare metals they're talking about, uh, what happened was that uh, solar thermal moved into the background. Mm -hmm. Now what is happening is solar thermal, after that, that, that plant I mentioned, which is in Spain, by the way, and has been working since 2011. The since solar thermal has been has come up, come back is coming back again. Um, the cost of solar thermal has dropped and dropped and dropped. There's an 800 megawatt power plant coming up in Dubai, and will be ready in two years in, by 2022. Um, <clears throat> it's starting in 2020, uh, where the cost the power purchase agreement has already been signed at 7.8 cents. All of you in America average for the country as a whole are paying an average of 12.05 cents per unit of power, per kilowatt hour. This is 7.8 cents. Even after adding whatever grid costs and so on, it, it, it still remains very much cheaper than the actual power price that we pay. So it doesn't really matter that it's, good, it's still a little more expensive than solar photovoltaic. The, for the market, that's very important. For the investor, that's very important. If he had to choose between 7.8 and 6.2, let's say, he will go for 6.2 every time. He is an individual. He will look at today's prices, and he will do that. He will never take the macro picture of what happens if all of us do this. If all of us do this, there is no, no, there, there's no tellurium, there is no cadmium, you are, you're done for. And you're up a blind alley. And by the time you come back, you've lost 20 more years, mm -hmm. which you can't afford. That, that is what, one, one reason. And the second reason in the case of, bio, in the, in the case of bio, biomass is that it simply does not interest the West where the technology is being promoted. Because you have, all, you have the control of all the oil in the world just now. So quite simple. It's a question of urgency of need. So the question then arises whether the urgency of need which one will prevail, you know? Are we gonna be able to switch to these clean technologies before, you know, the concentration of greenhouse gases, you know, keeps rising? Because yes, indeed, with the recent drop in oil prices that we have seen uh, over the past, you know, since the big boom in 2007, I mean, there is a lot of concern that, you know, this investment in green technologies have stalled and the appetite for that has gone down with adverse consequences for yeah, emissions and so on. I'm very glad you mentioned the, the, the drop in oil prices. First, there, 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 there have been three in a row, 1986, uh, 2008, and then 2014. Each time there were a shelf of projects in biomass-based transport fuels ready and, and, and about to be implemented, and they were shelved. In the first lot, I was personally involved in Bombay. Mm -hmm. Uh, then Bombay, now Mumbai. <clears throat> so what it means is that if you want this to, to, if you want these new technologies to come in, you've got to create a stable investment environment. Mm -hmm. There is no stable investment environment if the countries of the world don't jointly decide that we will not allow the yo-yoing of oil prices uh, and which is based upon commodity futures, speculation, um, fracking, uh, a new technology coming up. We will not allow these to, to prevent, uh, prevent uh, to, to change the investment environment of investors. Otherwise, nobody will invest. You don't need subsidies today. You need a stable investment environment, which means that we need a joint decision for every country to decide that we will base our future oil product prices upon the long-term uh, price that oil actually has 
mm -hmm. if you commanded and is likely to command. That I think is extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other things I will not, you know. Can we uh, can we go to the audience questions? So um, we will start some rounds of questions. I have uh, uh, maybe two remarks. Um, one is that most of these new technologies, renewables, they have a hard time to be scaled up on a level that will really make a difference in the long run. So that might be one important question. So this is the scaling. Can you scale those up? Of course, there are many, many new uh, innovations, but the scaling is a problem. The second point is, and uh, what uh, Edenhofer and others say, if you look around the globe, most of the uh, fossil fuel energy in the developing world is coming from coal. And there was a wonderful paper that uh, was uh, actually Sanjay said this around on the, on the coal in India. So to get, reduce uh, the uh, fossil fuel energy, you have to reduce this is the coal production and the coal supply for this. So to make the difference in the carbon budget, what people call the carbon budget, the carbon budget is so to speak threatened to be surpassed. The carbon budget is we can compute the uh, two one degree uh, or one point five degree uh, temperature requirement of Paris, and we can convert this into how much carbon can we still emit emit in the atmosphere. And this is called the carbon budget. So to speak, this is uh, tends to be uh, surpassed through particular through coal. So um, these are two questions, but we can take more questions and then um, each of you can respond to those. So questions from the audience. Yeah. I was very happy that Prem uh, mentioned, I was very happy that Prem mentioned the word capitalism, but he didn't say that capitalism was responsible for the problem of not taking up these new means of uh, securing the energy we need. Uh, he talked about uh, making changes in the market. Uh, well, that sounds like a very wishy-washy way of saying do away with capitalism, because capitalism, of course, is only concerned, I mean, the leading capitalists, with maximizing their profits. And to the extent that they don't want to even admit, especially in the United States, many of the biggest ones, that uh, there is such a thing as climate change. But I was disappointed that our first speaker didn't even mention capitalism, whereas she danced around the subject by showing how much it was necessary to make changes in uh, how we secured the kind of energy that the world needs, and that Prem went on to document is there, has been there, and is rather easy to use. So aren't we all uh, avoiding the big question of why, when the problem becoming so great and leading to such disastrous future, uh, why we're not uh, talking about and thinking about, well, now how do we move beyond capitalism to a more ra rational, not market, but more rational way of organizing our lives together? Okay, we can take one other question, maybe. You just uh, can then respond to it. Um, I have uh, two questions, Superior, actually. Uh, your research is very interesting. Uh, however, I was wondering uh, about the variables used to analyze uh, the environment's impact, because you focused on uh, temperature and uh, carbon, etc. And uh, I've been working with uh, development projects uh, in Brazil for the last years. And at least at the firm level, firm level, uh, what I notice is that the uh, that the environment issue that really concerned the uh, the firm and the, the entrepreneur was not exactly uh, the climate, but uh, other issues as waste, uh, uh, sanitation, and it really uh, impacts the cost of the production and decreased productivity, and. I want to know if you uh, have this data, if you ha if you know uh, a research or another uh, paper that uh, associate this issue with productivity. 
And uh, another question that, that I would like to, to, to do is regarding uh, the adaptive strategy that you proposed. Uh, do you can, can we ensure that uh, the cross the cost increase uh, as that may happen as a consequence of this strategy would really uh, balance and uh, balance the the decrease of productivity of climate change? Okay, so uh, you may want to uh, it's a I think our, your questions are very, very specific, and you know, I'm a climate expert only from the point of view of its macroeconomic consequences. So I think you know, Prey will be much better positioned Probably answering those. To this, yeah. um, so on the capitalism, and you know, um, why are we dancing around it, and so on? Um, right, yes, I mean, uh, maybe. I did not exactly understand your question of, you know, um, why you believe this is the only system that would have generated these problems. And if you have an alternative, you know, and how do we gather around, um, uh, how do we gather the political support and the popular support to switch out of capitalism to an alternative system? I mean, that would be, yeah, something that I'd love to hear more from, but I personally, you know, do not feel like I have an easy solution of, you know, uh, first the question is, is it really, you know, what is the alternative to capitalism and to allowing kind of the market to, uh, you know, to set the prices of certain commodities? I mean, these are things that are now not in the control of one particular country. Not every country has resources to oil, this, you know, would require the cooperation of countries around the world to set these policies. And then we see how difficult it is to get, you know, agreement on anything, you know. I mean, actually, you know, this is a big concern for us is that there is a big retreat from, you know, countries' willingness to cooperate, to engage in multilateral cooperation, even though we are facing these global risks, climate change being one of them, but there's a lot of risks that we are facing that have many, you know, um, uh, international spillovers, such as risks of conflicts, of epidemics, and so on. And uh, countries are becoming increasingly disengaged, actually, from looking into a multilateral solution. So in some sense, you know, we are being pretty pragmatic and to try to think of kind of what is within the more feasible set of solutions what we should be looking at because maybe reaching out for the ideal is a little bit too difficult especially especially these days um, but uh, maybe Prim can, can follow up yes so um, on the question about um, so we used the temperature and precipitation because this is really something that's very easily measurable very objectively measurable. We have it for, as I said, for a very large number of countries, you know, much smaller aggregate than the country for a very long, um, um, long uh, for, a very, very, for a very long time period. I mean, there are other aspects of climate change, such as, as you mentioned, the increasing air pollution and so on, um, which have negative consequences. Um, I do, I'm not aware of, you know, data that exists consistently, but, you know, I am aware of studies that have linked, you know, uh, air pollution to health outcomes and probably it exists, probably it exists for Brazil, you know, what you're looking into, but I, I unfortunately I cannot really point you to the exact data sets. Um, we focused on these two, A, because of ease of measurement, comparability, and it kind of really are the two key aspects of the weather and from which everything else can be pretty much derived. Um, and the, your second question is how can we ensure that the, you know, let's say, you know, how can we ensure that we, you know, let's say we, we, have, we set carbon pricing, how can we ensure that we have a price that exactly covers the losses that low-income countries will experience for climate change? I think it will be very difficult. Um, but 
you know, very encouragingly, the IMF itself does a lot of research on that, and there's a lot of technical assistance for countries <coughs> in helping them exactly think through what is the right level of carbon pricing. We have a full, whole fiscal affairs department that has done a lot of work on it. Um, I personally am not the expert, but, you know, um, I'm hopeful. I think so far we are very far from even in the few countries that have engaged in carbon pricing, um, which are, there are very few. But, uh, I think it covers about 17% of you know all emissions. Um, the prices are still very, very much, much lower than where they should be in order to compensate for the negative externalities of emissions. Uh, but work is being done on these levels, and you know it's a matter of you know whether. Politicians, policymakers, economic agents um, are, end up having the willingness to get to those right levels of pricing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll just take the questions that you raised, really, and um, and, Bert, and Bert did, um, very, very, as briefly as possible. Uh, first, scaling up. Yeah. Um, as I was, as I said, uh, the largest plant that I came very close to coming into into operation was in London when where a an American company and four other other European other country five com five company a consortium of five companies uh, uh, signed a power purchase agreement with British Airways to provide them with aviation turbine fuel made from five hundred and seventy five thousand tons of London's garbage uh, every year. And this, uh, this thing was, uh, everything was set and ready for this. The technologies they, they had already fully developed, and I've talked to them, there, there was no problem about that. Um, this, uh, the, the only problem was financial closure. They were 60 million short of completing the financial closure when the 2014 oil price crashed. And they couldn't get financial closure, so that's sitting on the shelf. I know of three other projects the same thing has happened to. In 2007, an American company, newspaper company, called New Page, had signed up and begun work on a, 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 on, on a plant to convert the black liquor that they get from their paper, you know, paper, paper plant, uh, you know, you know, gasify the, that, that black, black liquor in order to produce methanol, in, and in addition to the vast amounts of heat that that, that you in any case get from it, and um, they had to stop because in 2009 prices crashed and methanol prices crashed completely. What is more, no one gave them the the mandated price. They didn't. No one told them, look. You started, this was the price then, and we will make sure you get it, and the, and, the, and the US government will make good the difference. That is what is required. That is what, that is the role that the state must play. And so th th there are, these have all been scaled up at, at various levels. As I said, you, you've got solar thermal power plant of 800 megawatts coming up. It's basically modular. The, the module is about 140 megawatts, and you can just keep multiplying it. Um, the, the current module, it, it may get bigger. <clears throat> that how long would, would a trans, trans, transmission, a, tra, a changeover take? I think the absolute minimum that you could do, given the constraints within which we work, would be about 40 years. My, the way I see it is, if, you, if the world took a decision that no more coal plants will be sanctioned by any of us, what has been sanctioned is sanctioned, it will be built and it will work, then 40 years is the average plant life of a coal-based coal, 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 coal power plant. And I, I, I've looked at the American data, and that's what it works out at. Uh, and, and when that happens, they, they, you've given them all the time to get back their money. And so therefore, the, cap, the, 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 the investor is not against you. He, 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 he knows where he's going to go, and he's going to go somewhere else with that money next time, maybe into a solar power plant. But 40 years is the time with a concerted decision that will be taken for, for, for completing the this sh this shift out of coal and natural gas. You know, when natural gas is not much better. It's only at a transitional stage. Um, the, the rest, bio, biomass ga gasification come up, can come up very fast. It, it takes three years, three to four years to set up a plant. And, and you, you, can, you can cover the country, the, the world, pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> now, 
I, Bert said, I, 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 have, I have not um, said that uh, given an alternative to capitalism. There isn't an alternative. We, you will never, you need the enormous power, the enormous innovative power, engineering power, etc., of global capital today to make the shift in 40 to 50 years. You've got to have them with you. To have, have them with you, they must see that they can make money. So the two things they require are, first and foremost, the, 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 the stabilizing of the investment environment, and second, a whole series of incentives that are already there, tax breaks. I'm going to set up a biogas plant, a biogas based, a bi biomass based um, fuel plant somewhere in, 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 in let's say in, in Niger or somewhere like that. Okay, for going there, we give you a, a break on your, on, 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 you, you're an America based company, we're going to give you a tax break on your, on, on, on your corporate taxes. That's the kind of thing that you need to do. But all of this in, it comes under one an umbrella, which is the real problem is not capitalism or rather, you know, a market economy. It is a market rec economy with absolutely no state controls, whatever. It, where, where, with no state control. guidance, not control. You need you, 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 the, the, the state or the conglomeration of states need to take the, the, the decisions on which direction the, the market economy should go in. And that is not being done today. What we have is neoliberal capitalism, which is a recent development of the last 20, 25 years. And I think that this is, a, a, it also existed in the, in, in, the, in the beginning of the 19th century, you know, and it took 50 years of fighting and turmoil and people being hanged and all kinds of things, like the Chartists, before you got to a point where you had the beginnings of social democracy in, 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 in Bismarck's Germany. The same thing will happen if we wait 50 years, we are dead. You've got to do it today. So I think that that's the thing. And um, finally, you talk waste and things. Waste, sanitation, those are, the, those are other problems I didn't touch on. The fact is that the gasification of biomass takes care of urban waste. It takes care of air, a large part of air pollution. In India, we're get it, getting it from urban, the burning of urban solid waste mostly, and from the burning of rice and wheat straw and stubble in the fields all around Delhi, millions and millions and millions of tons of it. And so that these, both these disappear if, if, if you go, go down the gasification route for crop, crop residues and start producing transport fuels. The technology exists. And I think that, what, the, you know, all these problems, air pollution, you know, um, sanitation, um, and then uh, f f vulnerability to droughts and etc. all of these things can be taken care of these by just these two technologies. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. We can go on. Yeah, we can go on with questions. So, uh, thanks, Ron. Oh, Sanjay. And then the lady up there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, first, maybe there up there. And then Sanjay, yeah. And then the third one. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the two pre presenters for their presentations. Uh, very well done. I have a few questions for both of you. Um, the first well, actually, I believe they're all for uh, the delegate from the IMF. Um, with the latest IPCC report indicating that we're already on a trajectory to exceed our carbon budget, which is above one degree Celsius, I'm very interested in hearing why one degree was used um, to show the different scenarios throughout the research in terms of the impact of climate on the economies in the various countries. Why was one degree chosen as opposed to probably two or 2.5? Can you also say how the IMF will be using this research to guide the formulation of their policies to assist uh, these countries in whatever way that they can? Is, are they using it in anywhere? Or do they have plans on trying to integrate it in some of the work that they're doing? Uh, the third question has to do with um, some of the parameters that were used in the study. Do you know if they considered uh, the impact of external shocks to the economies, or was it only looking at the variability of 
the variable of climate, sorry, and what would happen, did they consider um, probably uh, wars or conflict within regions to produce those uh, rates that were given? And the final question, sorry, I was writing them down while you were going. Uh, can you say if the research also broke down the economic activities into various sectors to ascertain if some sectors are more vulnerable than others when it comes to climate change? And if we can access that research anywhere, that'd be lovely. Thank you. Andre? Thank you, uh, Vili, uh, for organizing this and to both of you for this very enlightening, excellent discussion. Um, Petya, I wondered if, if you could talk a little bit about the other potential impacts of climate change. I know that it's hard to fit it into a panel data-based model when you have nonlinear effects for which uh, there has been no relevant uh, prior observations, which may well occur in the near future. For example, as you know, there's discussion about rapid melting of Arctic ice sheets. Just two days ago, there was a study that uh, was widely publicized about uh, changes in the Gulf Stream, which are likely to have enormous consequences for Europe and for the eastern seaboard of the United States. So it's not just uh, low-income countries, which, as you know, only contain 16% of the world population, so-called low-income countries, as opposed to the so-called middle-income countries, which contain uh, roughly two-thirds of the world population. It's not just low-income countries, middle-income countries, but, but middle-income countries and high-income countries that are going to be affected by what has sometimes been called global weirding as opposed to global warming. So I'm, I'm missing the global weirding uh, consequences. And I wonder whether a study of the kind that you present, however important it is as a baseline, uh, as an exploration of one possible set of consequences, could even begin to, to, to help us with those larger questions. And how would you think about and how is the IMF thinking about that larger set of questions? Is it on the research agenda? The question I have for Prem concerns whether your, uh, uh, I think, very hopeful and uh, inspiring uh, uh, invocation of possibilities that, that we have for avoiding catastrophe, climate change catastrophe, uh, requires the cooperation of all, or whether it is sufficient for it to be taken up in a certain range of countries, and if so, which countries. I'm thinking about whether, for instance, certain pivotal emerging countries, such as India and China, could take the initiative, or whether uh, they, in conjunction with Europe, uh, would suffice to do so. We've seen some not very inspiring examples recently. For instance, the Chinese, as you know, were seen as dumping uh, solar panels uh, and they were criticized for that by the Europeans, otherwise, uh, who otherwise set a positive example with respect to renewable energy. But it seemed as if the Chinese were doing a favor to the world in terms of facilitating renewable energy adoption, and yet they were criticized because there was an economic interest at play, a seeming zero-sum game in regard to that. And it's very hard to imagine in the current scenario the U.S. doing very much that's progressive. So this is a political question as well as... Uh, question about what is the critical threshold in terms of efforts to make it economically viable and to avoid uh, climate change uh, disaster. And may I just make a plug, not just for the current book, but quite a number of years ago, was it 20 years ago, Prem? You, uh, Prem wrote a book called The Twilight of the Nation State. 13 years ago. 13 years ago, but he was talking about it. There were previous writings. There was another book before that as well, which was really about the rise of fascism in the developed countries. And he predicted, uh, in effect, the rise of Trumpism and, and related it to deindustrialization, globalization. I recommend the book to you. Quite an extraordinary discussion from a Polanyian point of view as to how and why that might uh, be likely to be on the horizon, and I'm afraid exactly that has taken place. So I think Prem is a political realist, so please inject some political realism as well, uh, if you will. Thank you. One more question. We can have maybe one more. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, for Petia, um, with regards to IMF loans, for example, we've seen countries like Antigua and Barbuda hit by very um, 
harmful or severe uh, natural disasters. And one of the things that they were calling for was debt relief during those periods. Is this something that now the IMF is conscious of the impacts of climate change, including natural disasters? Is this something that they would be soon looking into affording to low-income countries, given a lot of the nature of the support that is given by the IMF and the World Bank is through the loan system? Okay, so you want to move and start? Thanks a lot for these good questions. Um, so the first question was why are we looking at the effect of one degree Celsius increase in temperature? Uh, this particular permit, uh, parameterization that we were looking at has you know, actually nothing to do with the IPCC and the projected increase. It was just a simple unit to illustrate the, the findings, but basically if we had decided to go with two or three degrees in, uh, increase in temperature, everything would just need to be multiplied by two or by three. But we just really went with one degree Celsius increase to illustrate kind of what are the effects of, uh, you know, the fluctuations that occur over shorter periods of time. And then when we move into uh, kind of projecting climate change where we take, you know, what the IPCC projects, you know, temperature increase may be, then we actually take the numbers that they give us, you know, for each part of the world. For example, there was a map that I presented. So we looked at for each part of, for each grid, what the IPCC projects the increase in temperature will be. And we use that number. So in some cases, it's, you know, four, five degrees Celsius. In others, it's, you know, seven degrees Celsius. In other parts of the world, three degrees Celsius. So we use the actual numbers. But for, for just consistency, we presented the results, you know, um, with the standardized one degree uh, increase in Celsius. How does the IMF uh, use the results of this chapter? Uh, I mean, I think the IMF is becoming increasingly aware of, you know, the macroeconomic consequences that this is becoming, you know, a macro-critical issue. Um, and, uh, you know, there is uh, two ways, I think, three ways in which, you know, the, the, finding, the findings of the chapter and in general this whole, you know, um, uh, agenda of looking into climate change is uh, kind of operationalized in the IMF. The first thing is we do, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of technical assistance to countries, which is really much more about mitigation of climate change. And we do a lot of assistance about energy reform um, and um, you know how, how this should be done, uh, energy price reforms, because a lot of countries have a lot of subsidies, you know, which make uh, you know production, you know, a dirty form of production of electricity, you know, appealing for um, uh, and you know with consequent you know uh, excess emissions. Um, so we do a lot of uh, of um, uh, technical assistance on carbon pricing. Um, we have one of the world's leading experts on that um, at the IMF. Um, to foster adaptation, it's mostly just kind of policy advice through our annual engagement, which you, each of our members, you know, specifically it's very relevant for, um, you know, for, for the island states uh, in the Pacific, for which, you know, I mean, this is really a very tangible risk. Um, with, the, you know, just discussions about kind of what is the optimal risk management, to what extent countries should try to kind of transfer this risk, engage in, with financial markets, with insurance and things like that. Um, and uh, we now have some pilots, uh, you know, it has completed 16 pilots. I have my notes here. Uh, you know where we have you know really much more intense discussions with our with our you know with the member countries on energy and climate issues because this was really not part of the initial remit of the fund you know we were looking at kind of fiscal monetary policy and this is a whole new set of issues that we are now kind of trying to get up to speed with and we are collaborating with the world bank in trying to provide you know um, uh, our members with the advice that they need um, in terms of countries that experience, you know, um, the adverse consequences of natural disasters and, you know, this uh, kind of touches upon the second, the question that I also got about Antigua Barbuda. Um, we do have, um, uh, countries have access to special emergency financing facilities, 
And, uh, you know, recently, you know, the amount that they can borrow under, under these instruments was increased significantly um, to better uh, meet the requirements of these countries. I cannot really comment on the idea about moratorium on the debt and debt relief for countries that were uh, affected by these disasters. I, you know, have not followed up on kind of what you know the decision has been. I know that staff was assessing together with the World Bank of the damage that had occurred and kind of the ability of the country to, you know, um, uh, stabilize economic growth and, you know, uh, deal with the debt that they have. But unfortunately, I, I really do not have the information of, of uh, kind of where, where in the process we are on that. Um, so you had asked me about whether we were looking only at the the parameters in my in our estimation. We were whether we were looking just at the temperature and precipitation shocks. Whether we had controlled for other external shocks such as wars and conflict. The answer is not. We had controlled for the occurrence of natural disasters uh, because um, we were wondering to what extent you know the effect of weather may happen may happen only through the effect of weather on natural disasters. You know, is just the increase in temperature, does it have any effect beyond the effect that it has on natural disasters? And the, the answer is that, uh, yes, it does have. Natural disasters are damaging, but an increase in weather, increase in temperature is also damaging for hot countries, uh, even if you control for whether natural disaster has occurred. So it operates through these two, through these two channels. Um, we haven't looked at the effect of wars and conflict, but there is actually a whole literature that argues that, to a very large extent, uh, the occurrence of conflict may very well be driven by uh, very severe weather shocks, you know, that have big economic consequences and kind of the scarcity of resources that that brings kind of in, may ignite conflict, you know, whether in within a country, whether, you know, across communities or across countries and so on. But it's something that can be easily done. And in terms of, I think you had mentioned whether the, act, the, the data, I don't know whether you meant the data or the analysis or the um, uh, on kind of which sectors are more vulnerable to climate change is available. I mean, we describe what we find in the chapter, and we're actually planning to, we're in the process actually of uh, trying to put all the data and do files or whatever we used for the chapter available on the website whomever for whomever wants to access it. So on Sanjay's question about, um, yes, we focused on this one very, very specific aspect of climate change. We, you know, I did not present it. We have a ton of caveats in the chapter. This is so narrow, right? Because there's so many things that we just have no historical precedent. We have nothing to say about, we, I mean, we just cannot really know what's gonna happen. The effects could be gigantic, um, you know, about like the effects of the rise in sea, sea level, the melting of the ice sheets and so on. Um, we are kind of very people who like to deal with data and with tangible stuff. We have not gone into, uh, you know, trying to quantify these effects uh, um, you know, we try to just put a lot of caveats. But we also try to mention again, uh, you're very right in pointing out that it's really not only a low-income country and hot country problem, because a lot of these other parts of climate change that may happen, the weirdness is really going to affect advanced economies as well. And that's something that we find in the case of natural disasters, that the effects of natural disasters are really kind of the same, whether it's an advanced and emerging market and low-income country. So in that sense, we may overplay a little bit the unevenness of the, you know, um, consequences of climate change, but we try to be specific that it's really about the temperature increase. Yeah. Um, yes, very briefly, I know we're running out of time. Thank yes. you, Willie. Uh, I just want to say something. You're, uh, I think it's imperative for us to understand that the, that the next few years, change is going to be non-linear. Uh, there's a book by Peter Wadhams called Farewell to Ice. I strongly recommend that people read it. Uh, Wadhams is possibly the foremost expert on Arctic ice in the world. And he has pointed out that not only is ice 
it, the area of covered going down, but the mass has gone down by 40%, which means that a huge part of the area that is theoretically covered by ice in summer today is so thin now that it's being waves and wind are breaking it up and it's just pouring out from the two exits from the, uh, from, from, from the Arctic Ocean. And that is what is th threatening the thermohaline current today. So we are, that is a, once that begins, my own feeling is that actually that's the beginning of the end. Uh, you know, we, 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 we really do not have time. And, and, and he, he says that this could happen as early as 2020. I think he may be ex excessively pessimistic. But um, the, the thing is, I think that we have got only 10 or 15 years in which to start making an, an impact on this. We need, finally, I think we need a very clear target. There's no point in talking of one degree, two degrees. This means nothing. 2100 is not when, carbon, when, 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 when the global warming is going to stop. The amount of carbon dioxide that will come into the atmosphere by, by, by 2100, 30% of it will, 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 will continue to warm you all till 2200, and 15% of it will continue to warm you for the next 1000 years. So if you talk of humanity, and, and not just our grandchildren, but our grandchildren's great-grandchildren, then they have no future at all. So I think that it would be absolutely imperative that we have a, t t the James Hansen is the only person who has given a, t a target, which I think is both achievable and absolutely essential. It is to bring back the concentration of CO2 by 2100 to the level it was in 1950, which is about 312 parts per million. Today it's 404 parts. It's going to go up to about 450, 470 probably, if, if, even with the maximum of, of effort. It's got to be brought down by about 100, 150 points. And that means 1,200 tons of carbon dioxide have got to be taken out of the air. Thank you. I'll stop there. Well, let me thank you as audience to come here. Let me thank you the SIPA uh, team, uh, Bridget, Julia, and Diana. Diana. And uh, we have to thank the Tyson Foundation and the um, New School for Social Research uh, uh, Dean's office has supported very much this uh, uh, this event, and in particular, I want to thank our two speakers for this very enlightened uh, presentations and uh, very uh, nice response to the questions. So, thank you very much. <laughs>